Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And we continue our conversation with the top candidates in the California recall race. This week, Republican Assemblyman Kevin Kiley is in the house. Great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Uh, this week, we got the final list of candidates um, who qualified for the recall election. The order that they're going to appear on the ballot. We're just a few weeks away from those ballots actually going out. This whole thing is moving fast. There are names that are familiar to many of us, like Kevin Faulkner, John Cox, Caitlyn Jenner. We've spoken to all of them here. But another name has emerged in recent weeks, and that is Assemblyman Kevin Kiley from Sacramento. He's become one of Governor Newsom's most frequent, most aggressive critics in the legislature. He's a graduate of Harvard and Yale, <laughs> and uh, he uh, joins us now. Welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. That's right. I uh, look forward to hopefully coming back many times in the future. All right, so, so let's start with the question I ask everybody at the beginning, which is, why you? Well, look, I'm running to carry this uh, movement, what's become the greatest citizens movement in California history, over the finish line. You know, uh, we have ha seen thousands upon thousands, eventually 2.1 million Californians who signed the petition, uh, who many in cases put their lives on hold, many folks who had never been involved in politics before. I've been fighting at the Capitol for five years to change the trajectory of our state, but now I see a whole new element being brought to the equation, and that's the voice of the people of California. But, I mean, everybody w could say that. What's different about you? Well, you know, I got involved in the recall for the purpose of, you know, supporting the folks who are making this happen. And so I did not, like, wake up one day and say, I want to be governor. I went around the state and did 50 events to support the recall to try to, you know, support the folks who are making it happen. And, uh, you know, as we got closer to this final phase of it, uh, I had, you know, thousands of those people, probably tens of thousands who said, you know, and I had said, I'll play whatever role I'll play. I can play yeah. to get this across the finish line. And they said that we think that that's it. And, you know, having spent now five years in the legislature, I think I'm the only person uh, running Who's, who's been involved or is involved uh, at the state level, I know exactly what the problems are and how we can go about fixing them. Uh, well, you are still not as well known as some of the other candidates. Our viewers on CBS 13 in Sacramento know you well. A lot of viewers around the state don't. So let's get to know you a little bit. One thing that's especially interesting about your background is you started as a teacher uh, it, for, with Teach for America in Los Angeles. I did, yeah. So I am from Northern California. Uh, I grew up in the district that I represent, uh, but I actually did two stints in LA. Uh, I was a teacher uh, at a high school here called Manual Arts High School, which is kind of by USC. Uh, and then I also, after I went to law school, was back here and was in private practice for a little bit, not too far from here. And what did you learn from that experience as a teacher in the classroom? There's a picture of that. Well, uh, there you go. I had, a, and that's actually from a, uh, a debate team that I started when I was there. And we traveled all across the state. We had a bunch of kids who got involved, and a lot of them went on to great colleges. Uh, and I actually had a tremendous teaching experience. Uh, but I also saw, you know, how badly our public education system is failing our kids in a lot of ways. I taught 10th graders, and the average reading level was fifth grade. And so uh, I'm the vice chair of the education committee now in the assembly. And my number one priority when I was elected was to fight for education reform and educational opportunity for kids. And you've been in the assembly. Since since 20, or got elected in 2016, re-elected in 2020 as well. Uh, you've become a big critic of the governor in the last year. You literally wrote a book about the recall. Let's put that up on the screen. Uh, it is called Recall Newsom. So what Very is, creative title. What is the case, real briefly, on why Governor Newsom needs to be recalled? He's abused the public trust. This governor took extraordinary emergency powers uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and used them for personal political gain and to reward the special interests that put him in office. We saw that almost immediately after this pandemic began. Yeah, there were some that say he maybe took some bad steps, but that a recall would be, should be for something really extraordinary, something criminal that somebody does. And there are people on Newsom's team that say, look, he's done a great job. The state is in, is in a massive surplus right now. Uh, the economy seems to be moving pretty well. The forecasts for job creation in this state are very high. What do you say to people that say he doesn't deserve to be recalled, he deserves to be reelected? Well, the job creation is only high because we lost the most jobs. We still have only recovered half of our jobs uh, that were lost during the pandemic, and we're having one of the weakest economic recoveries uh, in the country. But actually, California's COVID-era outcomes have been, I would argue, the worst of any state. To take just one counterpoint, if California, on a sort of population-adjusted basis, uh, had the same outcomes as Florida did, millions more kids would have been in school, hundreds of thousands more people would be employed, and thousands more people would be alive.
although they would say that the numbers uh, for California in terms of vaccinations, in terms of case count, everything is better here than it is in Florida. What, what though, um, why does he need to be recalled now? You've got an election next year, a uh, few months away. Right. Why not just do it then? Why go through this $200 million process of having a recall election? Well, for one thing, it should have happened earlier. You know, the uh, legislature a few years ago passed a new law to drag out the process to make recalls harder. The whole idea of a recall is like, yes, we need him gone now because he is not doing what is best for the state. So the very fact that they've been able to push it off is itself a symptom of the political corruption that we're trying to get rid of. But I actually think the timing may end up working out pretty well. And here's why. Because if the recall is successful, then the governor, and this this is what I would do. I would call a special session of the legislature, and I would move immediately to tackle the core issues that are lowering quality of life in California. I would advance education reform. I would tackle homelessness. I'd tackle the cost of living. And if the legislature refused to work with me, if legislators refused to get the message that the era of corruption was over, then they'd have a chance to face voters themselves in 2022. I mean, wouldn't you assume that they would refuse to work with you? Why would they work with you? Because this would change the game. If we have the people of California who put their mark directly on our state's politics, it's going to send a loud and clear message. And the one thing that I know from my time working at the Capitol, the one thing that state politicians will respond to is political pressure, the fear of losing their job. And so I would throw down the gauntlet immediately and say, here are the key issues. Here's what the people of our state are demanding. So either work with me or we're going to have another election next year. Well, one of the key issues that the governor is facing now and that you would face if you became the governor is still uh, COVID. Um, in L.A. County, uh, officials have made the decision to bring back the mask mandate, even though the CDC says that that is not necessary. Um, there's a lot of anger over that. There's some people that say, look, this is what's needed. We see a, a rise in cases. We see a lot of people that are still not getting vaccinated. What do you do about COVID-19 if you're governor, and what do you make of the mask mandate? Well, I look at what other states have done and what's worked. I mean, we've been at this for quite a while. And, uh, you know, states that have taken a much different approach than California have actually done much better, not only in terms of keeping keeping their economy going, keeping their schools going, but having better public health outcomes uh, as well. And so, you know, the idea, as you just mentioned, of having a new mask made in L.A. County, that runs against the scientific consensus that exists at the state and federal level. And it's of a piece with the way California has handled this whole thing. And Nate Silver, who a lot of people look to as sort of the high priest of data science, he referred to the not particularly science driven regime of COVID policies in California. So what do you do differently? Well, I would leave it in the, to the judgment of individual citizens how to live their lives. I mean, we've never had greater familiarity with any disease at this point than we have with COVID-19. And of course, the levels are nowhere near where they were uh, at their peak. And so folks know how to protect themselves. They know what precautions to take. And we, I would leave it up to individuals as to, you know, how to go about living their lives. And part of what you want to do, though, is get rid of the state of emergency, which allows for these orders in the first place. Right. Because if you said we're no longer in a state of emergency with COVID, L.A. County wouldn't have the ability Right. to put in the mask mandate. Yeah, right? I would end the state of emergency immediately. It's an absurdity that this still is still in effect. Andrew Cuomo in New York has ended the state of emergency even in that state. And what's important to know is the state of emergency is a legal term. So if we end the state of emergency, that doesn't mean, oh, COVID is gone. COVID is no longer a threat. It means that we no longer meet the legal definition, which includes not only that there's a uh, grave peril that we face, but also that localities, local jurisdictions, don't have the capacity to deal with themselves with the usual allotment of powers. But isn't there maybe a reason that local localities should have uh, differences. We've got 58 counties. Not every situation is going to be the same. In L.A. County, way more dense when it comes to population than other areas in Northern California. Shouldn't there be local control? Isn't that what most Republicans want? No, I'm agreeing with you. I think that that's the way it ought to be. However, there is sort of uh, a limit as to the uh, powers that anyone in government can have uh, under, unless under extraordinary circumstances. And I would argue that we are no longer in those extraordinary circumstances. Um, let's talk also about the, the biggest issue for so many people, which is homelessness. Your governor, what's the plan? What changes? Well, homelessness is an absolute tragedy. And we have, you know, what, a thousand plus people die on the streets here in L.A. every year. The unsheltered homeless population in California right now is nine times larger than the next closest state. And despite all of this, we keep throwing billions and billions more at the problem every year. The governor's own mental health czar in March said that this is not a money problem. It's a leadership problem. So we need new leadership. And in brief, what that means is you need to have a roof over the head of folks. You need to have a place for them to go. We cannot have people living and dying and languishing on the streets. And once they're there, once they're sheltered, we need to connect them with the sort of services with which they can turn their lives around. Mental health counseling, substance abuse treatment, job training, and so forth. The governor, though, says that he's 
going to spend $12 billion to have exactly. more roofs over people's heads. Do you disagree with that? And if so, where do you get more money? Where, where do you pay for roofs over people's heads? Well, I mean, we are spending a ton of money on homelessness. We increased spending by billions of dollars last year, as you just said, $12 billion this year. As a legislator, I actually asked for an audit of all this homelessness spending, and the governor's administration intervened to stop it from happening, even though there was a poll showing 90% of Californians favored my audit. So there is more than enough money in the system. As I just said, the governor's own top mental health official said it's not a money problem, it's a leadership problem. But the governor's approach of just putting folks in hotel rooms and then hoping that causes the problem to magically disappear there's no evidence to support that. This isn't brain surgery. We can look to what's worked in other states and, and, and model our approach after theirs. So real simply, what though does that look like with you in charge? It means that we need to have shelter for folks and then we connect them with services and then maybe you can actually provide incentives once you successfully c complete, let's say, drug abuse treatment or you successfully complete mental health counseling. Then maybe at that point you, you know, get uh, some more accommodating circumstances. But you can't just throw someone in a hotel room, not provide them the tools they need. They'll just end up back up on the street. Let's talk for a moment about the way that the Democrats are playing this. We know that they are saying that this is a Trump-driven recall by right-wing extremists. Uh, and that is something that Newsom's team says over and over again every day. So let's just talk for a moment about President Trump and get it out of the way. Did, did you support President Trump in, in 2020? And, and did your thoughts on him change after January 6th? Look, my, my approach to all this is I stay out of national politics. We have more than enough trouble here in California. And what Gavin Newsom is trying to do is to try to distract us so that we're focused on anything other than his failings as governor. And so national politics is divisive. People have polarized opinions on the president. I think we can find common ground in California around the very basic failures that are destroying our quality of life here. So I don't delve into any of that. That's been my approach since I was first elected. So you have no take on President Trump and January 6th and insurrection at the Capitol? No take? I mean, of course I condemn January 6th. I mean, that's, you know, that everyone right. did. Uh, but uh, no, I have very much decided to stay out of the national level because that's exactly what Gavin Newsom does, is he tries to make it all about anything other than the problems we have here in California, which is why this recall is so important, by the way. In any other election, there are a million other things on the ballot. You have local races, you have a presidential race, you have Congress, you have Senate, and it's not as easy to connect the dots between the failures of our state government and the challenges that people see in their daily lives. But the recall, the recall is our opportunity to have a focused conversation as a state facing one question. Why is it that in California we sacrifice the most and we get the least in return? Uh, so when they say that you're, uh, you know, a, a, a pro-Trump uh, person and that a lot of this is fueled by racism and, and fueled by the same extremists that we saw on January 6th, which is what they're going to say, which is what they're already saying. What do you say? Well, I mean, certainly anyone can make things up and say right. them, but I've been, you know, out there uh, working with folks on the recall uh, for months and months, thousands, but tens of thousands of people who put their lives on hold, who would spend every weekend going out gathering signatures. These are not just Republicans. These are independents. These are Bernie Kratz. These are people who said, my child was stuck at home for over a year for no good reason. This right. governor caused my kid to fall behind. This governor lowered my kid's life expectancy while his kids were in private school. He knew full well that there was no good reason for kids to be at home, and he did it because his biggest special interest benefactor told him to do it. So to answer your earlier question, why does he deserve to be recalled? If that is not grounds for removal, I don't know what is. Of course, the, the, there are two questions on the recall ballot. One of them is, should he be recalled? The second question right. is, who should replace him? And you're running against a lot of other Republicans, Larry Elder uh, running as well. We had him on the show last week. This is what he said about you. Republican Assemblyman Kevin Kiley. A very good addition to my cabinet when I win. Maybe I'll try to offer him my, my job as chief of staff. He's a very, very sharp guy. <laughs> What'd you make of that? Uh, very nice, Larry, and I feel the same way about him. He's an extremely powerful voice for moving our state, our country in a better direction, and I'll give him the same offer, maybe a chief of staff. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, we play, that was during a game we play called the name game, which is where we ask for a, a word or a short phrase um, to describe the different people that you're running against. Uh, hopefully we can do this uh, quickly. So uh, let's put them up there. Gavin Newsom. Corrupt. Kevin Faulkner. Did some great things in San Diego. Larry Elder. Tremendous voice for change and uh, a key part of this movement. I thought you were going to say chief of staff. Uh, <laughs> John, Future chief of staff. Yeah, there you go. Uh, John Cox. 
Uh, someone who's given a lot of his, his himself and his, his, uh, his resources to the cause here in California, a successful businessman. Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, someone who's bringing, I think, a great perspective and, uh, you know, is part of the, of, of the voices that are coming from diverse walks of life to make change in California. All right, so you sound very complimentary about your opponents, but uh, why, though, you over them? Well, see, I, I think that question is not the primary election question in this race, because we are all on the same team when it comes to the principal but, issue. But it is a question in this race, though. I mean, there, that, that, there is question number one. No, no, you guys absolutely. are all there. But then people are looking at that ballot. There's a lot of names there, and somebody has to decide, OK, I got three different Kevins. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just three. There were five yeah. before, so there's been yeah. some winnowing of the Kevins. Yeah, but I, you know what I mean? <laughs> so people are trying to, to separate themselves. No, no, themselves. absolutely. Yeah. So here's the way I see it is that unlike a regular election where they are just your opponents pure and simple, you know, uh, in this case, we all share the interest in removing Gavin Newsom because none of us can win unless that's the case. So all of my fire is going to be aimed at the governor and making the case for fundamental change. And I think that whoever draws that contrast best, whoever can show that they will be sort of the polar opposite of what Gavin Newsom has done, that person will naturally rise to the top on the second question. I think that the way that I'm going about the campaign in really trying to just channel, carry the torch for the citizens' movement that has got us to this point, that is what this is really all about. And that is the sort of change that we need in California. It's not Democrat versus Republican. It's about restoring power to the people of California, serving public interests rather than special interests. Okay, so let's get to know you a little bit more and have some fun. This is where we play personal issues and we get to know some of your favorites um, other than just the policy stuff. You ready? We put 30 seconds up on the clock all for right. the rapid fire. Here we go. Uh, what is your favorite TV show? Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, good choice. Favorite book? Oh, man, I'd go with probably Animal Farm. I used to teach that. Oh, wow. It gets okay. better every time George you read it. George Orwell. Sport. What's your favorite sport? Basketball. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a Kings fan, Sacramento, but uh, now that the rivalry has faded because we're so bad, probably not the worst politics here in LA. <laughs> what do you do to relax? Uh, I actually watch a lot of sports, and the one thing that's non-negotiable for me is going to the gym and getting exercise. Uh, you know, I go crazy if that doesn't happen. And uh, who is your role model? My role model, uh, man. I think, in politically speaking, I'm a big fan of uh, of Lincoln. I've read a lot about uh, you know his early life and, and how he he rose. But I mean, I think that you know when you look at uh, in my own life, I'd point to people in my family, my dad, uh, and uh, I've been fortunate to have a lot of great mentors along the way as well. And is it true also you were uh, uh, like a high school basketball free throw champion or something? What uh, happened there? Something like that. So I was cut from my high school basketball team. I hit my growth spurt a little late. Uh -huh. uh, but then I kind of randomly entered this shooting competition put on by the NBA. It was a two-person thing. So my partner and I, we won. We kept winning, kept winning. And we ended up going to the NBA finals. And it was on Nickelodeon. <laughs> and we were the national champions in this basketball shooting competition, even though I was never good enough to actually play in high school. <laughs> Totally random thing on my, on my in wow. my career, my resume. <laughs> well, next time we do this, we got to do it on a basketball. Court. Yeah, and we right. also hear you're a fan of John Mayer. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I don't so, mind John Mayer. So, so we've got some some music uh, to go out. Uh, this is waiting on the world to change, which I think is fitting with the uh, political, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, next as we as we bump up the music. Thank you so much, Kevin Kiley. Great to visit with you for the first time. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Come, more, come back. More of the issue is right after this.